Cool. So we'll kick off with some introductions. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Oscar Davison. I'm the business development specialist here at Let Us Grow, uh, and I work within the commercial team. Hi, everybody. My name is Temi Adoigne. I'm a mechanical engineer here at Let Us Grow, and I'm the engineering lead of the Aeroponic Rolling Ventures project. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lucy Plowman. So I work for CHAP, Crop Health and Protection, uh, as a technical liaison officer. Um, so I'm based at one of our partner sites, Stockbridge Technology Centre, uh, where I look after the capabilities on site, including uh, our vertical farm, where we carried out the trials that I'll be chatting about today. Cool. Yeah. So just to jump off, I'll give a, a brief introduction to um, Crop Health and Protection. So we are one of four UK agritech centres uh, set up and funded by Innovate UK uh, to really be a nexus between government, industry and academia um, and to really act as a catalyst um, for the kind of discovery, uh, development, delivery and adoption of uh, agritech innovations worldwide. So our vision is for the UK to be a global leader in the development of sustainable applied agritech to help secure our future by nourishing a growing population uh, and to do so with economic, environmental and health benefits to society. So our expertise and our capabilities um, are built around kind of various different areas in crop production. Uh, including things like intelligent agronomy, control environment agriculture, um, crop and soil health, uh, and crop and protein diversification. Uh, and all these different areas sit within four grand challenges that we and many other companies um, are currently trying to tackle. Uh, and these are climate change, food security, sustainable production, and resilient food systems. And so the work that we've been doing with Let Us Grow, that obviously I'll be talking about in a little bit, uh, kind of hits all four of these grand challenges, uh, in particular, food security and resilient food systems. Uh, obviously, we've been looking at improving the efficiencies of vertical farming, uh, which in turn um, helps to promote local food production um, and also kind of reduce the risks um, associated with traditional farming. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so recognise some familiar names in the attendee list, but also some new names. So. For those of you who are less familiar with Let Us Grow, I'll just have a few slides to give a bit of an introduction and background to who we are. So Let Us Grow, yeah, we are experts in aeroponics. We are a diverse team of over 40 plant scientists, engineers, developers, and business experts. Uh, we have an award-winning approach to how we do business and develop products. Um, to date, we've raised just over 10 million pounds of investment. Um, and with that, we've delivered 15 projects across the UK and in Europe. Um, and for those international partners, we are Bristol UK. Um, so our purpose and ethos has been pretty clear from the start. Um, the fresh produce supply chain, the global fresh produce supply chain, uh, overly centralised, um, they're unresilient, and the result of this is excessive waste and emissions. Um, distributing these close to the point of consumption using CEA is something that's really interesting to us. We believe it's one way of helping us to build a more resilient uh, food system, as well as baking in transparency, something which um, is going to be ever more important going forward. Um, but the CA industry um, can always be improved, so that's where we're here to help with our aeroponics. So a quick whistle-stop tour of our history. Um, so Let Us Grow was born in 2015. Um, but things really began to gather pace in 2020 when we opened our world leading aeroponic research centre here in Bristol. Our three climate control chambers um, have provided us with a springboard to really get into the science of aeroponics and to work out how it can be best applied within the CEA industry. Um, so here we work on both plant science, but also engineering. So the first product that we took to market, you may be more familiar with our drop and grow container farm. Um, this is a turnkey CEA solution, perfect for R&D, pilot projects um, and inner city projects as well. Um, and last year, we were really excited to launch up at Stockbridge in the trial with CHAP, our aeroponic rolling bench. And that's what we're here to talk to you a little bit more about today. So before we, we dive into um, the specifics of the rolling bench and the trial up at Stockbridge, I thought it'd be worth just touching on a bit about a bit more of the science behind aeroponics. What is aeroponics? Um, so essentially, aeroponics is growing plants um, in a nutrient dense mist. We take a nutrient solution, much like you'd have in a hydroponic system, um, and we turn that into an aerosol using ultrasonics, high frequency sound waves. Um, this aerosol forms a thin film on the plant's roots, and this thin film uh, allows for 
greater gaseous exchange, so more oxygen, and a, a, a larger surface area for nutrient distribution. And so this helps the crops to grow um, and respire uh, more efficiently. Um, there are other ways to do aeroponics. Um, some of you may be familiar with um, more kind of familiar high pressure nozzle systems. Um, while these have the same um, benefit for the plants, some of the challenges there um, are more focused around full system automation and integration. And that's where our ultrasonic approach helps. And it really removes some of those barriers to um, full system integration at scale. Um, this is science that we're doing here at, in Bristol in our R&D center, but it's also working collaboration with leading global ac academics uh, across the globe really to verify the results that we get, but also to help develop more crop specific IP. Uh, brilliant, thanks Oscar. <clears throat> so the Aeroponic Rolling Bench product is our latest product, which takes all of our knowledge, our experience and learnings from um, our static aeroponic systems and packages it into a suitable product for large scale industrial greenhouses and vertical farmings, uh, farms. So as a design team, our ethos was to ensure that this product was suitable for both in rolling benching facilities, um, but also suitable for new build products. Um, whether that's glass houses or vertical farms. So with a real industrial agricultural focus, this is a much bigger scale to what we've produced um, in the past. So from the beginning, we are considering commercial viability. So that's in the design process and also from an operational perspective, really trying to embed that into our process right from the start. So through testing as much as possible from the beginning, um, with what Lucy's gonna talk to you a bit more about in a minute, we're learning quickly and we're constantly iterating to optimize this product as we move forwards. Um, and as always, we are striving to minimize our impact on the environment, both in terms of design, be that through our material selection, um, but also through operational efficiency and the lifetime of our products. So we have an R&D team here in Bristol um, working in parallel with the engineering product team to refine as many aspects of this product, both hardware, but also growing in operations um, as we continue to iterate and improve. So this slide is just a brief kind of high level breakdown of what the prototype looked like that we installed at Stockbridge Technology Center. So it's, it's quite simple with kind of five key subsystems. So those of you that are familiar with standing uh, standard hydroponic rolling benches, there will be some components here that look, yeah, very familiar. Um, we've tried to keep the aluminum bench frame, for example, standard um, initial, uh, so seamless integration with, with the facility that they have there in Stockbridge. Um, the Stockbridge facility is a rolling um, hydroponic bench vertical farm that's operated manually. So what we did then was we took the a standard sort of hydroponic tray, a plastic tray, and modified that to make it an aeroponic one. So that meant embedding our ultrasonic atomizers into the base of that tray. So this, is, this plastic tray fills with water and the ultrasonic atomizers then produce the mist locally within that. The grow trays were bespoke designed for Stockbridge's um, sort of operations and, and uh, requirements um, in this case, but this is kind of where you'll see a difference in growing method between aeroponics and hydroponics. So in aeroponics, our crops sit sort of suspended above the base of the aeroponic tray, which allows the roots to kind of grow downwards into a zone that's filled with this nutrient dense mist for the roots to, to take up. Um, and then you'll also notice on the screen towards the bottom, we have our electrical components. So there we have an IP rated um, small electrical enclosure, which is connected to a sliding electrical contact. So that contact ensures that wherever the bench may be um, sort of rolled along the length of its, its path or wherever it may be in its mobile facility, um, that there's always a power supply to those atomizers to allow that mist to be generated within the bench. Lucy. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, so I'll um, cover a bit about the trials that we've been doing at Stockbridge Technology Centre. So these have been within um, our vertical farming development centre um, based at Stockbridge. Um, and this is a uh, commercial scale demonstrator vertical farm, uh, which was kind of designed for um, to be a test bed for growers and researchers to use to trial their technologies or their processes um, at scale. So the main operators have been uh, myself based at CHAP uh, and also Adam Olmrod, who is based at Stockbridge, uh, and he kind of looks after the novel growing systems on site. 
So in terms of the timeline, uh, we've carried out five trials uh, in total with Let Us Grow, um, starting from November last year all the way up until February this, uh, earlier this year. Um, and having multiple trials has really allowed us to not only get really comfortable and familiar with operating the rolling benches, um, but also uh, giving us a bit of flexibility in terms of making adjustments to the technology and to the experimental plan as necessary uh, to really make sure that we are giving a fair comparison between the two growing systems we've been looking at. Um, and it also um, has meant that we've been able to generate enough replicated data sets um, to share with us Grow for use um, for further analysis. So the crops we've been looking at have been kind of commercially um, relevant microgreens. So these have been micro radish, micro coriander, micro rocket and pea shoots. Uh, we've also been looking at a couple of different um, growing media as well through these trials. So these have been grow felt uh, and Holland bio jute matting. Uh, and the key aims of these trials have really been to uh, give kind of an unbiased comparison between the aeroponic and hydroponic bench performance uh, for Let's Grow to be able to uh, test their hardware in an industrial setting uh, and for myself and Adam, aeroponic rolling benches. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, so just to go into a bit of detail on the kind of methods um, for the most recent trials uh, that we carried out uh, in this series. So uh, we focused on growing micro radish, um, uh, the variety was sangria, um, on the grow felt growing media. Uh, and this was using one level in the vertical farming development center, uh, which equates to a growing area of 28 meters squared. Uh, and you can see from the diagram there, the layout has been uh, alternating hydroponic and aeroponic benches on the same level. And this has just been to really minimize any uh, variation in the environmental conditions between the two growing systems. So, yeah, we began by fully saturating the grow felt before sowing the radish at a density of 135 grams per meter squared. Uh, and then we yeah, germinated in the dark for five days. Um, and this is quite a long germination period, but it just meant that we could really maximize the height of the seedlings before switching on the lights uh, and allowing the green uh, the leaves to immediately green up. So after five days germination, we then grew the uh, crops for following five days after that. Uh, and this was under an artificial day length of 16 hours, uh, a light intensity of 250 micromole, uh, and the chamber was set to a temperature of 22 degrees and a humidity of 65%. Uh, in terms of the fertigation, uh, that was set to a pH of 6 and an EC of 1.5. Uh, and for the scheduling, um, for the hydroponic benches, we were kind of carrying out our uh, typical um, irrigation regime, which was four irrigations per day each irrigation lasting long enough for the grow felt to become completely saturated uh, before uh, draining away again. Uh, for the aeroponic benches, we were irrigating in 15 minute intervals, and this just allowed us to maintain a um, kind of sufficient water level on the benches for the atomizers to be able to function. Uh, in terms of the misting schedule, and then four minutes off. Um, so after 10 days in total, we then harvested all of the above ground fresh weight uh, to give uh, a yield result at harvest. Um, and along the way, we were also looking at things like crop height, uh, uniformity. Uh, we were collecting kind of photographic records um, and also taking some folio samples as well for nutritional analysis. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, so just to uh, jump into the main findings in terms of uh, the yield uh, from these trials. So, yeah, we were getting some really positive results from this. Um, so we harvested a total of 55 kilograms from the aeroponic rolling benches um, for each trial. Uh, and you can see from the graphs there that this um, kind of equates to, on average, eight kilograms per bench for the aeroponic benches uh, compared to around six, 6.5 for the um hydroponic benches. Um, and so this represents an uplift of 22% for the aeroponic benches compared to the hydroponic ones. Um, and this on average is about 4.5 kilograms per meter squared um, fresh weight for the aeroponic um, grown crops compared to only 3.7 um, for the hydroponically grown crops. So from the photos there, you can for the aeroponic um, benches, uh, and we're also getting taller crops as well from these ones as well. Um, those photos there are taken eight days, so just a couple of days before harvest. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, brilliant. Thank you, Lucy. So, yeah, as a, an engineering team, it's obviously incredibly useful to get just the opportunity to sort of test our prototypes right at the beginning and get feedback on it, really. So, you know, we really want to ensure that what we're designing and building is not only fit for purpose, kind of from an engineering and integration perspective, which, of course, was the sort of main intention of these trials, but also efficient from um, you know, a growing and operational perspective and getting direct feedback from the people using the product day in, day out is, is highly valuable. 
So the more we can learn at this early stage, the more opportunity we have to modify the design to make sure that we're kind of seeing improvements quickly at these, these design cycles that we're running regularly. So what went really well with this trial was the integration with the existing um, infrastructure that, that they had there at, at the Stockbridge Technology Centre. The installation process was really smooth. Um, we set up in a day and um, the benches, yeah, rolled into the system seamlessly. So that was really, really positive. Um, and this particular trial actually tested a maximum um, length. It was about 15 metre length of conductor rails. So that's the sort of power distribution um, along the length of the test chamber. And we were really, really pleased with the electrical efficiency that we saw with this. Um, along this length, we saw sort of negligible losses. So a really high, um, highly efficient um, power distribution concept. Um, and finally, of course, we were really pleased to see, see the yield improvements that Lucy's just discussed, especially you know, with a, pro a prototype um, and the first of its kind, seeing kind of results like this is really encouraging because we already know there are plenty of areas for us to improve going forwards, um, some of which we've identified here. So a particular focus um, in this current design iteration that we're now doing subsequently is to ensure that our latest product can accommodate or integrate well with sort of standard industry um, familiar, both matting and plug um, plant trays. Um, as I mentioned before, the ones that we used at Stockbridge were kind of bespoke designed for those needs. Um, we're also modifying the electrical contact design. So as you can see in that photo there, the, um, the electrical contacts just sit above the conductor rails. Um, but we did have some faults throughout the trials where they could be knocked um, out of alignment. So you, you break basic kind of geometry revisions and design updates um, will solve that. So that's something we're working on currently. And finally, recipe optimization. So we have recipes that we know work really well for aeroponics, and we call them our gold recipes. And those have been developed in our static um, system research faci um, facility that we have here in Bristol. Um, so we're also, we have a, a growing team working on optimizing those recipes and ensuring that they are appropriate and optimized now for this much larger mobile bench product. Uh, product. Cool, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, so you know, it's just a chance for me to reiterate that you know, we're at the start of our aeroponic rolling bench journey. Um, and by working with industry partners and experts, we hope to bring advanced aeroponics to the mainstream growers across the globe. Um, and the way that we wish to do that um, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, we have a development journey, we have a pilot program, that is all based around collaboration. So you can see from this pretty basic schematic that we have a series of, of follow-up internal development programs that we're going to be enhancing and building on some of those engineering learnings that we've had from the Stockbridge trial, as well as integrating those with our um, the Knowledge Mark Grow team to make sure that we're, we're updating those. At the same time, we want to be working with commercial partners to develop the technology and test the technology in-house in their, in their operating farms in, in the real world, as it were. Um, because that's where the systems are really going to uh, have impact and that's where we can learn, learn the most uh, in terms of getting that real life knowledge feedback into the product as soon as possible um, and create something that is yeah, going to be useful for everyone. So I think that wraps up the presentation part of this webinar. Um, thanks for watching. I think we're going to now move over to questions which Lucy is going to read out for us. Yeah, um, we've had a nice mix of questions come in a little bit before the webinar and some live ones. Thank you for everyone who used the Q&A um, chat box. I think we'll go to the live ones first. So um, we have the first question here. What are the implications for the mechanics of aeroponics at scale within hard water regions? Um, Oscar and Temi, you're probably best place to pick up on this yeah. one. Thanks, Gary. I mean, well, tell me, we, Bristol, where we are as a hard water region, what have yeah. we done here to, to combat that? Um, so, yeah, I think sort of, yeah, as, as Oscar says, our, our facility here is it's, it, the, um, the technology works. It's not it's not kind of a, a barrier um, to operations in any way. Um, you know, there are means of sort of softening or um, treating the water if necessary. Um, but generally, that's not something we've had a major problem with. I think um, there are sort of occasions where you get sort of build up. Um, I think it's a calcium buildup, but um, yeah, with, with sort of our standard cleaning processes, it's never been a, a barrier to sort of the, the technology functioning exactly as we intended it to. Yeah, 
and I guess is their standard off the shelf, well, industry standards, um, water manifolds that can help with filtration yeah. if an area is particularly um, troublesome and that can be integrated into the aeroponic design, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. And second one from Scott, could there have been an ideal nutrient level slash pH level for hydroponics that would be different from aeroponics? Um, you've all had sort of experience with hydroponics and aeroponics. Um, yeah, who would like to answer this one for Scott? Yeah, I can I can take a stab at that one. Um, thanks, Scott. So, I mean, a short answer is yes, potentially. Um, obviously, in this trial, we were running the, the trials concurrently side by side to try and eliminate um, a certain number of um, variables that, you know, could skew results. So it was difficult to test that in this particular test. Um, is fundamentally the way the plants, or the way that the nutrient dosing is set up for hydroponics or aeroponics, I think there isn't too much difference in, in the requirements. Um, the way we obviously deliver the nutrients is slightly different, but that could be an interesting one for us to test um, here in Bristol. And the next one, we have a question from Robin, which is very similar to a question that we got sent in ahead of time. So I think we can probably combine them. Um, they're asking on the comparison of energy consumption, aero to hydro, um, and then we've got another one, which is the average water and electricity consumption for a complete growth cycle. I think, um, Tammy, you're sort of best place to comment on what was measured or what the sort of the goals were of this first trial and how, how the data kind of would help answer this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to take this one. Um, so yeah, for this first prototype that we built um, at and, and trialed at Stockbridge Technology Centre, the power usage that we had was 135 watts per metre squared. Um, but the power usage will always be dependent on the, the bench size, and it's obviously very heavily linked to the number of atomizers embedded within each bench. So these are something that we're you know constantly um, iterating and trying to optimise. Um, and similarly, the kind of it, it's it's difficult to kind of um, comment on this an, an average power consumption over a growth cycle because of course that will depend on the the crops that you're growing um, and the recipes that you're using. So the irrigation recipes can vary, for example, throughout the lifetime of the crop that you may want to um, sort of miss more or less as the crop develops. Um, you may also choose not to irrigate overnight. So there's a lot of um, sort of variation in the recipes there, but. Um, for this particular trial, yeah, we were operating 135 watts per meter squared with a 50% duty cycle, so four minutes on and four minutes off for the full five days of growth there. Um, and I think the second part of that question was on water usage. So the, the trials that we've done here, as I've mentioned, were sort of very much preliminary. So the main aim really was testing our kind of engineering performance and, and integration. So we weren't sort of specifically set up to be recording um, and comparing the water usage between hydroponics and aeroponics, mainly um, sort of down to the, the setup of the facility that there are multiple chambers at the Vertical Farming Development Centre, kind of all supplied by um, a single big reservoir tank. Um, and also any water that's not directly taken up by the crops is sort of recaptured in the sump tank and then redirected back to the um, supply tank. So, you know, really, in theory, nothing's lost. Um, so in terms of um, sort of water usage, there should be you know little to no to no difference relative to to hydroponics thank you um had a lot more questions come in that's great i'm just going to mix in some of the ones that we had sent in before just to make sure we cover as many as possible um so somebody has asked what automation is included in a complete aeroponic rolling bench system and what other is available at an extra cost Cool. Okay, I can have a go at that one. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I guess this is clear to state that you know we are the experts in aeroponics, and the part of the system that we are delivering is is that bench level componentry. So the the ultrasonics and the power distribution, um, and that's as far as you know the automation that, that we have that's within our wheelhouse goes uh, essentially, and it really depends on the system that that aeroponics is being deployed in whether that's a glass house or whether that is a vertical farm and obviously at that point the options become pretty exhaustive uh, depending on the, the kind of scope for install um, and, and the aims of, of, of the grower and operator um, but the idea behind you know that we're, we're baking from an early stage is that 
this system is retrofitable to numerous different scenarios. So it really depends on who the, um, the EPC provider, the person who's built the farm, what they're providing and, and how we can plug into that. Yeah, it might be worth also mentioning that the Stockbridge Technology Centre was a manual facility, but you know this is designed um, uh, to, to integrate with any kind of transport or automation systems that might already be in place if we were doing a retrofit project. Yeah. Um, and another one that's come in before, does every part of the system, hardware specifically, have long life trays, frames, electrical components? Uh, yeah, that's one I guess I can take. Um, so obviously, as we've mentioned, this was very much our first prototype, but um, we are absolutely intending for all of our products that we put out to have to have long lifetimes. I mean, that's that's I, I think a given that it, this product needs to withstand and, and stand up to the kind of um, processes that it will be put through and should be as robust as a, a hydroponic system is. Um, so yeah, in terms of the standard uh, products that we use, the off-the-shelf frame, um, the inserts, the trays, I think those are, you know, just standard hardware that will be, yeah, with, with stand the test of time. Um, and then we are, we develop our own atomizers in-house um, to produce the, the ultrasonic, uh, to ultrasonically produce the mist. So again, lifetime is something that is part of the design specification and criteria for the team here who are developing those in parallel. Thank you, Tammy. Um, so another one that's come in live um, from Alicia. How do you monitor the humidity level across the aeroponic bench to make sure to ensure the humidity has appropriate level? Do you apply sensor technology in your system? Um, Temi or Lucy, you could probably comment on the sort of the mechanics that you used in this first trial for humidity. Sure. I mean, do you want me to just jump in first there? Um, yeah. So obviously um, trials we carried out in our vertical farming development center. Um, so we don't we do have sensors uh, in the vertical farm, um, but they're not kind of at the level of uh, per bench. So we wouldn't be able, we couldn't monitor humidity kind of um, across each bench. Um, they're more just to get um, an average uh, reading um, kind of throughout the chamber. Um, so um, that's just kind of, yeah, uh, relating to, to the trials that we did. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Tammy, do you want to jump in? Uh, no, that, that's good. I think you're best place to answer that given, yeah, that was sort of part of how the trial was run. So thank you, Lucy. And I think this covers sort of aeroponics, how it works as a whole. Bruna asked, has asked, how do you avoid mould? Um, so pests, disease and um, things like mould. Oscar or Temi, do you want to sort of comment on how the system is set up to sort of reduce this? Yeah. yeah, of course. So um, things like addressing mould, there's uh, you know, an implication how we design the technology, you know, whether it's trays or or the benches themselves, you know, there is a, a certain amount we can do to kind of eliminate space for mould. Um, but you know, it, it's a fact of, of of farming that there are going to be ingress of of certain things that you maybe don't want in there. So the management of those um, really comes down to the operational efficiency of of the team who's managing the farm. And to that end, you know, as well as developing the technology and recipes, we're also developing a number of standard operating procedures um, for how to best operate or the, understanding the best practice for how to operate our aeroponic benches, um, which we can work with and provide to our customers to ensure that they can roll those up in their own um, farm management principles to make sure that mold can be avoided in the system. Yeah, and um, I guess from a sort of physical design hardware perspective, um, we sort of have some rules of thumb that we try to use, so avoiding any kind of tight corners. We try and make sure everything is um, has a radius on it, so that it's easily easy to clean. Um, surfaces are sort of hydrophobic, and you know all of the standard things I think you'd expect to see in in a in an indoor farming facility, really. Yeah, and just to, to jump in from like a more general standpoint, I guess. Um, I mean, we didn't see any kind of mold problems uh, throughout the trials. Um, we did with Let's Grow, but also any other trials we've done um, in vertical farming because the cycles are so quick. Um, you don't tend to get any buildup of any kind of pests and diseases because the, the crop is harvested before that can kind of um, take hold. Um, but yeah, so we, we certainly haven't seen any problems with mould. Um, and, you know, we do obviously clean rigorously between trials and things. So as, as Oscar was saying, kind of it's more the, the operational procedures that you put in place there to reduce that. Right. Thank you all. Um, 
another one that's come in before what crops grow best in this system and is there a limit to what i can grow good question um i guess you know te technically you could grow whatever you want it really depends um the purpose for which you you, you want to grow those crops um if we're talking about commercial food production um you know what we can grow in our systems is is quite similar to what you'd expect to find in, in a glass house and a, and a vertical farm currently so thinking predominantly leafy greens herbs those sorts of crops um we have however started to look at crop extension so we've grown um strawberries we've grown tomato plug plants for transplanting um we've grown tree whips um we've grown chilies we've grown a number of different crop types um and yeah the the viability of growing those crops really depends on on the market for them what the price you know that can be achieved for, for growing such crops is um as well as you know other technological advancements around how we produce energy and and, the, and that sort of thing so yeah i guess there is a, a long list of things we could grow um what we currently see being grow grown most prevalently in the vertical farming sector or the ca sector more broadly is more focused on those those leafy crops salad crops as well as um you know a, a select batch of, of fruiting crop too like strawberries and on the subject of crops we've had a, a couple of uh complementary questions um so in terms of fruiting plants like peppers tomatoes strawberries will long roots cause issue with nutrients and water distribution as well that's a good question I mean, it's not something we've seen um having grown strawberries here at, in bristol um the the way that our benches are set up is that you've obviously got that aeroponic root zone that Temi alluded to before, um, but below that you have about 20 mil of hydroponic nutrient solution, which we're refreshing on a periodic basis throughout the day. Um, so when the roots get to a certain length, they are indeed getting accessing that hydroponic root, root zone. Um, so you'll have an aeroponic root zone and a hydroponic root zone. Um, but the way that the bench is designed um, and where we put the kind of fill and drain ports, uh, that, that hasn't been a problem that we've experienced to date. Thank you. Um, and someone has also asked, what is the longest growth cycle in days possible for the presented system? In other words, which crops and what crop cycle length is suitable for the benches um, with the presented system of substrate? That's a very good question. I, mean, um, yeah, I suppose our trials were limited to the sort of four crops that Lucy mentioned there. Um, I'm trying to think with our system here in Bristol, I think we have done some much longer, much longer, longer trials. The longest I can think of are the chili plants we've had growing in there. Um, it, it, it rolls into the months um, and they keep on flowering and fruiting. So um, I guess coming back to farm process and protocol and thinking about cleaning cycles, that's where you can sometimes um come into issues if if you're having crops in there longer than your cleaning cycles it be can, can become slightly troublesome to, to clean around those so um it really depends on on how the rest of the facility is being managed and whether or not you have other crops in there as well whether you're growing um, a single crop or you're multi-cropping um and sort of uh yeah the process is in place to manage multiple crops perfect thank you Oscar. Um, Bruna has also asked, where do you do the germination stage? Um, Tammy and Lucy, you could probably comment on the germination sort of tactics you use for, for this project. Um, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so um, in our vertical farming development centre, we do um, have a germination room which can run at um, nearly 100% relative humidity. Um, we didn't actually use that for these trials just because um, we didn't feel it was really necessary. Um, it's a lot easier, as Timmy mentioned, we're um, kind of manually um, operated in there. So it's easier for us just to germinate directly on the benches uh, where the crops are, are situated. And we you know we have the space um, to, to be able to do that. So um, that's kind of where we were germinating, um, but we can run the chamber at a higher humidity um, to kind of um, achieve those conditions that, that are required for germination. Um, and as I say, uh, control the temperature as well. So um, yeah, that's kind of how we ran that. Yeah, and I think that would be, you know, an option. Again, it would sort of really depend on the facility that we were, or sort of project we were working on. 
Um, it might be that there'd be a separate germination chamber. I know a lot of um, sort of glasshouse facilities have a chamber, germinate on the benches um, and stack them, or, or some places may do it, um, yeah, in a completely different way. So that's sort of by trying to ensure that our design will accommodate different types of trays and the more we can kind of learn um, about the systems that people tend to use and the more kind of pilot projects we can do with people out in industry, you know, I think the better our chances of ensuring that our hardware is compatible with all of those different processes. Right, thank you. Okay, um, so if we go back to sort of the, the maintenance side, um, Scott has asked what sort of maintenance times on the overall system need to be considered compared to more traditional aeroponic systems or deep water culture. Um, it might be difficult to compare um, considering we didn't use deep water culture for this, but Temi um, or, or Lucy, I don't know if you could comment on this part. I mean, yeah, I think, again, this with this being a kind of preliminary trial, um, you know, it wasn't like a product that we you know, released to a customer with a, a sort of predefined maintenance plan. This is very much kind of a collaborative um, integration test. Um, but yeah, moving forwards, there absolutely would be something in place that, you know, a, a maintenance schedule, um, part of the standard operating mm -hmm. procedures as well, I assume, um, things like that. But in terms of, you know, maintenance, uh, I wouldn't foresee anything kind of so vastly different to, to a standard um, hydroponic system. We obviously do have the embedded atomizers. Um, so there might be some sort of checks and things like that that would be expected there just to ensure they're kind of operating as expected um, periodically. But um, yeah, I think that's something that will, will definitely be sort of developed and refined as we kind of near a product ready um, sort of offering. Yeah. And I guess, you know, comparing with the hydroponic systems, what we're looking at is a, an aeroponic product that can go through the same process flows as a hydroponic system. So mm -hmm. what we've seen um with our commercial partners is a fairly rugged and um rough way of washing trays where you, you know benches you flip on their side you put them through a um a sort of a jet wash i guess um and it gets rid of all the debris in the bed ready for seeding the next round so we're aware of those kind of processes and, and we're working to make sure that our aeroponic benches are compatible so that if there are growers who have a number of aeroponic benches and hydroponic benches we look at the same process flow for that, that bench to really kind of minimize that additional OPEX. Um, I think there was another part to the question that will say, how does it compare to say high pressure nozzle systems? Um, I guess where, we, where we've seen additional OPEX load from a, from a high pressure nozzle system perspective is where the nozzles get clogged. Again, earlier we talked about hard water, some soft water. Um, if you're pushing water at high pressure through a small nozzle to create mist, and that water has got a, a nutrient load in there, there is an opportunity for nutrients to precipitate out and block those nozzles. Um, and typically what we see in those larger high pressure nozzle systems is that's where a lot of the OPEX, um, additional OPEX is incurred in system maintenance of those, those nozzles. Um, twin with the fact that a nozzle-based system wouldn't be able to go through a, a hydroponic cleaning system or process, um, it would need a whole bespoke um, set up, uh, which could, you know, incur additional capex, but as well as um, operational expenditure and potentially kind of downtime to manage that. So it's it's about making sure that our ultrasonic aeroponic solution fits as well as possible with existing infrastructure, existing horticultural processes, uh, which people are using for hydroponic products. Yeah, and just just to say, obviously, my experience um, in the trials that that we ran, um, yeah, there was basically no difference between the two the two systems in terms of maintenance um as i said you know the cleaning um was pretty much the same for both of them so um yeah just from you know kind of a, a that standpoint it's yeah we didn't see any really difference between the two okay. and a, a very quick sort of follow-up question that complements that quite nicely is how is it possible that the ultrasonic um membrane will not get blocked by chalk or nutrients um, yeah, I suppose I can take this one. So yeah, the way that the, the mist is, is generated, that ultrasonic um, disc is obviously vibrating at high frequency. So quite often during operation, that's not something we see because of that kind of agitation. Um, so so long as, like, um, as has been mentioned before, kind of when the grow cycle is over, that the, the benches are cleaned as per any sort of standard um, procedure. That's not something that we've seen, seen before. 
Um, so yeah, I hope hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Um, and then going back to the question submitted before, how does it integrate with farm management systems? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so obviously for our drop and grow container farms, we developed Astara, which is our own in-house farm management platform. Um, Astara is capable of, of doing the whole farm management piece. However, looking at scale, looking at integrating with existing glass house and vertical farms, there are a number of um, preferred providers out there who are already doing the, the building management and, and farm management piece. So for, for, from a um, aeroponic perspective, it's about being able to plug in and talk to those, just like any light or any other performance enhancing element that you'd add to your system um, would be able to manage. And um, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't speak to exactly how that would happen. <laughs> um, I don't know if Temi can, but yeah, testing my testing my electrical knowledge and uh, maybe myself. Dip you in but it. no, but you're <laughs> absolutely right that it should be it will be something that is controllable by sort of any um yeah any other control system so whether that's you know our system astara or you know it being kind of open openly controllable by by any other system as well that's perfect and then just following on from that what's the that sort of after sale service and support provided by let us grow regarding the aeroponic rolling venture system um, and they've stipulated hardware and software yeah well it's, it's a good question i guess Again, just taking it briefly back to you know the products that we have out there and the projects that we're running. Um, you know, the success of those projects is 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 important to us. It's not a fire and forget operation for us. Um, we maintain pretty close contact with all of our customers via Astara. We can we can see what's going on on farms. We can help troubleshoot remotely. But we're all always all also ready to go on site and fix things in person if needs be. So, depending on where that customer is, we have a number of different packages that we can offer. But there is, you know, options for hardware and software support um, from Let Us Grow to, to help ensure that our customers continue to get an optimised performance out of the products that we are developing. Um, as well as that, we are always running trials here at Let Us Grow in our R&D facility. So any insights that we can gather through our research, whether it's related to um, crop performance optimization or um, you know, the economics of how to run the system more efficiently um, so looking at irrigation cycles and that sort of thing what we learn here we're able to share with our customers um, and keep that sort of live learning up, up to date yeah absolutely and i suppose specifically to kind of pilot partners on this early um sort of early stage process you know if we're working with people um as we're kind of getting feedback from you that's again um we would be supplying you know pretty um, I think pretty good support because we'd be interested to know how it's going, how we can help and get that feedback from, from you as well. Thank you. Um, I think we just have time for one more question. I'm, I'm hoping that I have covered everything that's come in, but as I've said, if I haven't, then we will follow up afterwards. Um, but we just have one more question from Phoebe um, saying, I'm unfamiliar with using the rails for power. How safe is this around water? Um, particularly water that's been misted into the air? Yeah, so um, what we did with this um, stock bridge um, installation was we were using 24 volts, so ultra low voltage. Um, but we also put in place um, operating procedures, um, light indicators and things like that. So in terms of um, operators or staff being present around the, the charged rails, although it should, um, you know, it is under, within regulation and, and safe, um, I think touch safe, um, is under the 24 volts falls under the touch safe um, regulations um, but we did actually just put in many additional kind of uh, safety features just to ensure that there was no sort of risk there or any risk there was mitigated um, and in terms of yeah uh, condensation um, that was something that we did actually see in this trial and part of the next iteration is about kind of how we house those um, those rails appropriately to try and reduce the impact of that um, but yeah, very much something we're working with um, industry experts because, you know, this, this is sort of a power distribution technique that's used, you know, in, in trams um, and trains it's, and even like um, industrial crane systems. So it's not necessarily an entirely new system. It's something that, um, yeah, we're, we're developing and working with experts to ensure is it's safe and efficient. Perfect. Thank you, Tammy.
Um, so thank you so much to everybody who joined us. Um, again, if I, we didn't get around to your question, we will follow up afterwards. But if you'd like to be the first to know about the next webinar, um, where we give sort of updates on our next trials and news, please do subscribe to the newsletter. Um, we've also got inquiries open for commercial trials. So if you're interested in how this might work in your own facility, do get in touch. Um, but for now, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.